Okay, well, welcome back from break, everyone. Um, we are going to dive into our next session here, uh, which is going to be a series of presentations where we're first going to hear a little bit more about uh, Caltrans's vision for developing a statewide active transportation program, and then a series of presentations on some of the more specific aspects of developing uh, such a program. So we're going to have um, question, we're going to take some questions, but not until the end of these four or five presentations. So please feel free to put them in the uh, Q and A box at any time, and uh, and we will uh, we will flag them at the end of the session. So um, Andreas, uh, you should feel free to share your screen. Um, first up, I'm going to introduce Andreas Kraus. Um, he's really the catalyst for for making this workshop happen. Um, he's the active transportation data manager at the Caltrans uh, headquarters division of traffic operations. Uh, he oversees the development of a new statewide active transportation census program that we're going to be hearing a little bit more about. Um, and Andreas has 25 years of engineering experience, including adaptive management and collaborative development of monitoring programs, uh, quite relevant to this effort. So Andreas, I will turn it over to you. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, everybody. Um, Mike, can you see the screen and can you hear me okay? Yes. All right. Perfect. Uh, well, thanks everybody for attending today. Um, so we'll jump right in. So first off, uh, just some terminology. In Caltrans, uh, we use the word census a lot to refer to our count program, and that confuses some people, but essentially, it, anytime we say census, we're just talking about the count program um, to get traffic counts and volume estimates. Um, and then active transportation, uh, we're talking bicycles and pedestrians, we're talking micromobility, non-motorized. A lot of people use different terms here. Um, all right. So Caltrans has been collecting uh, motorized vehicle counts um, since 1920, actually, so just over a century. Um, and that information has been used to manage the state highway for, for vehicles, um, and it's, it's critically important information. Um, but we haven't had a similar effort for active transportation or, or, or other modes. Um, so back in 2015, there was really a sea change in the strategic uh, management goals uh, for Caltrans and for the state as a whole with a new focus on walking, biking, and transit. And, um, and then those that new focus on walking, biking, and transit uh, was then further adopted in the future strategic plans and also in the California Transportation Plan 2050 and the uh, Climate Action Plan for Transportation Infrastructure. So these are, you know, this is where we're going is walking, biking, and transit. Um, so why do we need count data? I mean, it supports a variety of different needs from safety and planning, calculating uh, crash and exposure estimates, travel demand modeling, performance measures, project success. Um, so th there's a variety of different needs. Conversely, thinking about it the reverse way, each one of these management needs requires different sets of data in different places to different levels of detail. And the count program is gonna need to try to address as many of these management needs as possible. So really it's the management applications, it's the management needs that drive the monitoring objectives that then drive the design of the statewide program um, and ultimately the cost of, of maintaining that account program. So uh, understanding that there's a need for bicycle and pedestrian count data, um, the Federal Highway Administration included um, guidance on how to do that for the first time in 2016 in their traffic monitoring guide. And uh, that traffic monitoring guide is going to be updated here in just a few months. So look for that. Um, then California uh, came out with their state bike and ped plan in 2017. Um, and one of the action items there was to um, create a protocol for counting and create a, a database for the counts. Um, but there wasn't a lot you know, there hasn't been a lot done since 2017 on the counting front. And to correct that, um, in December of last year, uh, Director's Policy 37 on Complete Streets uh, essentially directed traffic operations uh, to create and implement a statewide bicycle and pedestrian count program. So uh, the active transportation count program was established in February of this year. and. Uh, and that's when I got hired. 
Um, all right, so there's two concurrent efforts that are underway right now. One is the statewide design um, where we're trying to uh, do that strategic planning that Liz talked about and, and come up with the, the plan for where we need to count what in, in all of that. Um, that's a multi-year process. Um, and, but we also need data now. So there's a, we're, we're, we're having a parallel effort that's a rapid deployment effort that's going to be focused on uh, our complete street projects that Caltrans is implementing um, between 2021 and 2025. There's about 34 projects in that, in that time frame where we'll be focusing on getting count stations established right away to help um, collect the data that's needed, but also get our hands dirty and understanding how to do this stuff because as an agency, we haven't done it before. And so that'll also help the, the experience side will also help the design. All right, so there's some key differences between the motorized count programs and an active transportation count program. Um, first off, uh, volumes for uh, the non-motorized modes are one to two orders of magnitude lower than for uh, the motorized modes. Um, the natural variability in the volumes and travel patterns for bicycles and pedestrians is much higher than, excuse me, for, uh, for vehicles. Um, the network density is different um, because bicycles and pedestrians use the sidewalks and other things. They use informal paths. They cross the streets wherever they want. Uh, so it's, they're in more places. They're going different directions. Uh, and and there's there's fewer of them and there's more variability so all of that taken together uh, means that uh, it's your statistical considerations uh, become really important so really the takeaway here is bicycles and pedestrians are much more difficult to count than vehicles um, and the statistical design is very critical all right so the traditional way of establishing a count program is you establish a few permanent and continuous stations that are counting 24-7, 365. And those are important to understand change over time, trend analysis, quantify that natural variability, and come up with extrapolation factors for short duration counts, as well as for calibrating big data. Um, then you would, you can't count everything everywhere, so to understand, to expand the geographic scope of where you have counts, you would do short duration counts at other locations, uh, and then you would try to scale those up based on the extrapolation factors from your continuous station counts. Um, those short duration counts often have uh, high error rates associated with them, and, um, <clears throat> and they're also, uh, you know, you're sending folks out into the field so that there's an expense with that and, and uh, some exposure estimates or some safety exposure just because you you have folks out in the field. So with the, with the modern era of big data platforms becoming more, more, more mature and robust, um, the approach that we're going to try to take at Caltrans is to try to minimize the short duration count part and really replace it with the big data to try to Get that geographic expansion of where we have our continuous counts to where we might want count information uh, where we're not counting. So we want to pair that big data into the design up front. So what is big data? Um, essentially, it takes location-based data from your cell phones, from GPS devices, um, stitches all that location-based data into trips, um, then assigns mode to those trips, and from that information, you can get all kinds of information. You can get volume information, trip speed, duration, purpose, origin, destination, vehicles, miles traveled, all kinds of things like that. Um, and some of this information that you can't get any other way than through big data, for instance, origin, destination, you, you can't count that out in the field. Um, so uh, big data brings a lot to the platform here. Um, but there's a big misconception uh, out there that somehow big data will replace the need for counts. And that's simply not true. Um, big data platforms require the count data for calibration. Um, otherwise, they, you, can't, you can't trust their values. Um, and then they, they make the count data more valuable by expanding the geographic coverage um, and integrating it with the other functions that big data provides. Um, 
to allow a much broader uh, calculation of, of performance measures than you could otherwise have. So here's an example from the city of San Francisco. Um, on the figure on the left is the location of their continuous bicycle count stations across the city. And then the figure on the right is the big data volume estimates that were developed and calibrated with that information. So this shows you how you can go from some information where you count to kind of information everywhere. Um, so that count data is used for the calibration of the big data platform. But when we think about the design process, we can then flip it around and say, okay, well, if we know that we're going to be using big data um, and we're going to integrate that into the program, can we re basically reverse engineer our count network to maximize the calibration potential of the big data platform while minimizing the number of stations that are needed to do that? Um, so that's one of the approaches that we're looking at right now within Caltrans. Um, but then once you have those volume estimates from big data, across your entire network, then what that allows you to do, one of the things that allows you to do and that San Francisco did is they cross, they cross reference that with their collision uh, data, which is the figure on the left to come up with exposure estimates, which is the figure on the right for those collisions. And then those exposure estimates then allow prioritization of uh, funding for safety improvements. Okay, so, the in, one of the innovations that Caltrans is bringing to the table here is we're bringing in a statistically robust design into determining of the network uh, of the continuous count stations. We're trying to pair it up front with the big data and through that process, limit the use of short duration counts. So timeline. Um, the first and most important step, which is where we're starting, is to define and prioritize our management needs, and those need to be defined with enough specificity to drive those statistical design. Then we have a series of things, uh, a series of efforts underway right now. Uh, we're, we're in the process of trying to create some statewide standards for, the count, for counting. Um, we're trying to create some statewide data repositories and databases to house the data that will be collected. Um, we're developing, we're starting the process now of applying that statistical design to create a statewide network so we can do that site, uh, identify the site locations where we want to do the counts. Um, and then we're pairing that with the rapid deployment effort to try to start, excuse me, to try to start collecting the data uh, now. So by 2025, hopefully, we will have a report from the design effort that will essentially lay out, here's sort of the full build out of what this count station network should look like. Um, and here's the trade-offs between cost and the information utility that you're gonna get out of that count network. And then as an agency, we can make a funding an informed funding decision on how much we want to invest in this count network, how big it should be, how expensive it needs to be, um, and what are the trade-offs between the cost and, and what it gets us. And then once those decisions are made, then we can basically continue that rapid deployment effort, but uh, continue it implementing the statewide design. Any large monitoring program like this requires uh, lots of collaboration and partnerships. Um, and, you know, from the management to the end users, to the data collectors, you know, ultimately this is trying to meet management needs. So they need to be included. Uh, the people who use the data need to have a voice in the system, the people who collect it, and then the statisticians um, to, to kind of stitch it all together and make sure that it's uh, valid and consistent. Um, but it also, you know, agency-wise, it's Caltrans, we need to work with our partner organizations and our federal highways, and also, you know, we're new to this game, and there are lots of folks and, and, and agencies in California that are already doing counts and so we can learn from their uh, experience and example. Uh, so it's a, it's a very dynamic and collaborative process. So lastly, I wanted to put in a plug for the Active Transportation Resource Center. Um, they have a variety of resources for active transportation, not just for counts. Um, they're a great resource. So if you don't know about them, please check them out. They also do happen to have a, a loaner program 
They have a few uh, count counters that you can borrow from them and, and do short duration counts. Um, all right, so that is it for me. Over to you, Mike. Thank you so much, Andreas. Um, so now that we have a sense of kind of where Caltrans is going, let's let's dive in a little bit deeper on on how to do some of this work. Um, you know, for Caltrans or or if you're a local agency or a regional agency. So we're gonna um, we're gonna turn it over to uh, Dr. Krista Nordback. And Krista, you can go ahead and share your screen. Um, Dr. Nordback is a senior research associate at the University of North Carolina Highway Safety Research Center. She has a decade of experience in bicycle and pedestrian traffic monitoring, um, and she has researched non-traffic, uh, sorry, non-motorized uh, traffic counting technologies and programs in Colorado, Washington, Michigan, Oregon, and now California State DOTs. And she chairs the Transportation Research Board Bicycle and Pedestrian Data Subcommittee. So Krista, we're excited to hear your presentation on uh, detection technologies and pitfalls and, and, and what's out there. So I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. And I'm trying to get my screen share working here. Um, okay, looks like I need to change the screen. And we have had people submitting a question or two. So just a reminder that you can go ahead and put those questions in your Q&A box at any time. And, and we will save a little time at the end of this session to, to talk about questions on, on all the presentations. Now looks good, Krista. OK, are you seeing my notes? No. OK. Um, so uh, here we have. Um, an example of an inductive loop um, that I first saw back in 2001 and started getting interested in in this whole topic of um, counting bicycling and walking um, with uh, technologies. And I've been studying it for over 10 years. I'm at the University of North Carolina and uh, great to be here today. So. Okay, um, so we'll talk about new and old technologies in intersection issues and uh, uh, maintenance. So um, Andreas already mentioned this, pedestrians and bicyclists have a denser network. This uh, arterial network I show here in the bottom corner uh, may be for motor vehicles, but bicycles have a denser network. They may be using alleyways. Um, pedestrians may be using lots of cut throughs, including cutting through parking lots. So a much denser network, higher variability, harder to detect, and less funding for doing it. So we have to be creative. Um, Pedestrians uh, often travel in groups, so when they pass a detector traveling together, it's harder to differentiate individuals. That's an issue. Um, also with pedestrians, they may cross mid-block, um, and they may be going from a vehicle to a building or one building to another, crossing mid-block and not even encountering an intersection, so much shorter um, trips and dif different travel patterns. We typically count bicycling and walking as um, a, a segment count uh, with including both uh, sidewalks. So we may have pedestrians and bicyclists on the sidewalk um, and we wanna count both of those and also bicycles in the, in the uh, road or micro mobility devices. Turning movement counts are another classic way of counting at intersections. Um, often for cyclists, we'll count um, the traditional way with the 12 movement um, uh, right through and um, left uh, methodology. And um, then the pedestrians are commonly counted in the crosswalk. Um, but this is a little bit of an apples to oranges type of thing because if a uh, pedestrian say does this motion, then they are counted twice because they they cross the intersection twice. And for safety studies, that's what we need to know. Um, but if you want to know the total volume of pedestrians through the intersection, you would be counting that individual twice. Um, 
Whereas if we used, if it was a cyclist and we converted that into the turning movement methodology, we would count that as one right turn. So these are different methodologies, sometimes used at the same intersections and lead to confusion. And also if the person is traveling along the roadway, crosses twice, but it's really a straight movement, um, there's a, a difference in how we would count those. And then resolving it to the, if we wanna know the volumes on the adjacent um, road segments, those are different. Um, so in this, in the yellow line, we would count those uh, the same way as the 12, as the the um, red line, um, and they're not the same um, in terms of where the person went after they left the intersection. And then we have another situation where if we have a right turn <laughs> in the crossing methodology, we don't count that person at all. And in the right turn, uh, in the turning movement methodology, we would count that person. Um, so. Again, there are some complications and we have to really think about what we want to get out of our counts. Is it just the crossings? Is it the volume through the intersection? Is it the volume at the intersection or the volume on the road segments that we need? Okay, let's talk about the technologies. Um, and my, my motto here is don't trust, verify. And here's an example of what Liz was talking about earlier that we wanna have somebody out there physically um, making sure that those uh, the automated equipment is counting actual bicycles and pedestrians. Okay, so the technology is not sufficient. I'm going to talk about technology. Um, that's what I've been asked to do. Um, but many technologies can count bicyclists and pedestrians. It's really about the package. Um, is, is the vendor um, equipped to do that? Have they created a product that will do it easily? And if not, um, the jurisdiction is often roped into helping with the uh, research and development. So as long as you're okay with that um, and realize uh, that, that that's something you may need to do, if you don't want to be involved into research and development, and um, I recommend that you choose one of the vendors that are already established in this field. Um, also, do they have a long-term commitment to counting cycling and walking? Are they going to be there in five years when you need them? Um, and are, are they going to support that product? Even if it's a large uh, vendor that's been there for a long time, I don't know if they will um, necessarily support that product. It may just be a one-off for them. So the vendor, and then also the installation, the local agency needs to know how to use the equipment and if it's um, going to really be um, working for them. And validation and calibration is also important as, as Liz has mentioned. Um, if you don't do that, if you don't sit out there and count um, at least 100 bicycles, in my opinion, um, then, then you don't know if you're really counting bicycles and what else you might be counting as bicycles. Um, are motor vehicles being counted as bicycles, for example? Um, so you need to spend the time and, and do the plan on spending hours uh, doing validation for each permanent count site. And then you need to maintain it. Um, if you don't maintain it, then <laughs> just throw your money away there for installation. Um, data transmission, automate that so that you can check the data continuously. And Julie is going to talk more about data management and data checking, which are also really critical. Okay, one true story here. Um, there was a vendor. This is a true story. And uh, they, they said, we can count bicycling and walking using existing cameras. And so they worked with the city and they helped with the R&D and they piloted the project and then they hired sales staff and then they got all these contracts with multiple agencies. And uh, then a year later, they said, well, you know, this doesn't work for our business model. So they just pulled out of bicycle and pedestrian counting. Um, it's not a highly lucrative field. So um, they left those state and local agencies without any contractor or vendor for their bicycle pedestrian counting programs. Don't let this happen to you. Okay, traffic monitoring guide. Others have mentioned it. Check out chapter four. It has this nifty table. Um, if say, if you wanna count bicycles and pedestrians separately, you can look up which technology will work. The black dots indicate the ones that are traditionally used. In this case, you can combine the infrared sensor 
which is looking for all the warm bodies with the pneumatic tubes that can detect the two hits of the of the bicyclist wheel and you see the cost is, is relatively um, affordable. Um, so these are the two technologies used a passive infrared counter um, looking for warm bodies. However, if you have a um, can you see my cursor here? Yes, okay. Um, so if you have a truck off to the one side and uh, it's far away, but it's still very, very hot, it can be detected. So be careful what might be off to the side here that you're pointing at. Is it something reflective? Um, these can cause problems. Inductive loops have been around for a long time. These were installed in the 80s in Oregon, and they can still work. Um, on a path, it's very easy to look for those two hits of the bicycle wheel. Another path installation, um, some in loops, uh, in, loops in um, bike lanes. These can work well. They can work horribly. Um, it depends on if your your product is able to differentiate motor vehicles from bicycles, because motor vehicles do occasionally go through the bike lanes. Um, in mixed traffic, you can this can work. So this site we tested, it's in a situation where you have um, low motor vehicle volume, high bicyclist volume. It's, bicyclists are like a quarter or a third of the traffic on this road. So um, this is the type of of situation where counting um, bicycles in mixed traffic will work if you have the right equipment and can uh, differentiate them. Guidebook 797, a great resource, um, NCHRP 797. It comes with two associated web only documents that document the accuracy of some common um, and some uncommon um, uh, it, technologies. So I'm just going to go through that quickly. Here are our, our loops, an example of the accuracy. So here they counted for, this is the gold standard for, for calibration and, and validation, 30 hours of video, they counted it manually, and then they compared that hour by hour or even 15 minute bin by 15 minute bin to the automated counts um, that they got from the detector and if those are equal it lines up along this this line and we see that it has good accuracy in this case it does seem to line up pretty well um, so we can say this has good accuracy unfortunately there are situations like this bike lane where the bicyclists may go around the detector and that leads to bypass errors and you can see here that um, folks are, are this is under counting so where when the dots are under the line that means we're missing some some people um, so here's a situation where the video counting that liz mentioned would would take care of that piezoelectric strips um, also work well when properly installed um, passive infrared um, it, it's known to undercount we see here some some um, bias where we're knowing we're undercounting because when people travel in groups, they are hard to count, um, just counts one warm body. Um, and again, here we see different vendors products. Um, so check out which vendor um, is which and choose appropriately. Short duration counts, we want to get at least a week of counts, ideally. You can't do that with manual counts, um, like the National Bike Ped Documentation Project, but you can get gender and um, helmet use if you need those from those short counts. Um, you can use a smartphone, but the uh, gold standard for calibration is video watching in the office. Here's an example of some video detection at a um, intersection, video counting. Um, pneumatic tubes can be used both on paths and on roads when you can, when you have a, a again, a product that can tell the difference between the um, uh, wheelbase of a, a truck or a car and the wheelbase of a bicycle. And those are available. And here are the accuracy of those. Again, um, look at your vendor, look at your product. Um, combining these two tubes and infrared works well um, and can be deployed at different locations. Some comments about intersections. Uh, different data types. Everybody collects their intersection data a little differently, which leads to some problems for data aggregators. And if they're in PDFs, it's a, it's a drag. All right. Um, detection is not the same as counting. So we all have signal detectors. Maybe they're counting by they're uh, detecting bicycles. Maybe they're working really well. Um, but 
the purpose of those signal detectors is to get the signal to change. Well, you'd rather maybe overcount, um, make sure that every bicycle is counted. Maybe you catch a few motor vehicles in the process. So um, if let's say you have, to have a thousand vehicles per hour going through on that lane adjacent to the bike lane where you're doing the detection and maybe 1% of those are counted as bicycles. It's not too bad if you're doing detection just for signals, but if you're counting that can totally mask your bicycle volumes if you have just one bicycle per hour, for example. So we would have to throw that data out for because I, I'm looking at the vehicle pattern, not the bicycle pattern when I look at that data. So trying to do two things with one device sounds great, but it often doesn't work. Um, so you have to think about your purpose and uh, what you want to do. Data transmission from the intersections is important, and I already talked about the differences between crossing counts and turning movement counts. Some other technologies, video image processing, and Liz um, covered that very well. It can work well. It can work horribly, just like every other technology. Test, validate, verify. Thermal imaging, same thing. Um, if it's in a bike lane with, separated from motor vehicles, it's great, um, much harder, and you have issues with temperature. Um, radar, again, it can work well, it cannot work well. Um, check out the, the information in the document. Um, okay, pedestrian push buttons, uh, great source of information because these are actual people pushing the button. Um, these are not falsely detected motor vehicles or trucks, these are actual people. So even though these are not counts, they do give you a measure of activity and Sarisha Koturi and um, Patrick Singleton at uh, University of Utah, they are doing some great work, um, Sarisha at Portland State, um, on, on this, how we can use this for our activity measurement for pedestrians, because pedest pedestrians are hard to correctly count, especially at intersections. Okay, um, other data sources, we've learned a little bit about um, some of these already. I'll say uh, the, the uh, for bicycles using bike share data, um, also GPS app data like Strava, um, those can be helpful. And um, we'll get to data management. I think Sarisha is going to talk more about those data sources later. Um, data management, University of North Carolina, uh, sorry, North Carolina State University working with NCDOT um, calculated $720 per year per count station is a kind of a baseline number for uh, maintenance that includes travel to the site, battery replacement, labor, and having multiple stations, um, multiple sensors at your station. So in conclusion, the vendor is important. Um, we need to ask for that third party accuracy. Can they provide you a peer reviewed study that shows that that technology is is accurate and works? If not, you may be in for a research project. Installation is important. Um, make sure you validate and um, document your validation so you can create um, bias correction factors at your site because all of these none of them work perfectly <laughs> and they all have little biases include maintenance in your budget include budget for staff time don't ask somebody who's already doing too much to do more signal detection diff is different than counting um, so we can't necessarily use one detector for both um, unless we change the way we're we're count we're um, uh, our algorithm. Automated data transmission is important so we can check that data as it comes in and make sure we don't have data gaps. And again, know your vendor. Are they going to be there in five years? Are they going to make the effort to accurately count biking and walking? Or are they just going to decide that it's not worth it and leave? Okay, <laughs> thank you all for your attention. Thank you so much, Krista. That was a great presentation. Some really good kind of practical tips and uh, and, and pitfalls. So um, thank you. There there were a couple of questions that came in during your talk. If you want to take a look at those, and then we'll we'll see if we can get to all of them at the end. Thanks. Um, so we're now going to turn to Dr. Philip Stark. And uh, Philip, if you want to go ahead and share your screen, uh, Dr. Stark is a distinguished professor of statistics at the University of California, Berkeley and his research covers a wide range of topics in the physical and social sciences. Um, he's currently serving as the leading statistician uh, for a current Caltrans project 
um, to develop an active transportation census program for Caltrans District One. So some some uh, some recent experience here. So um, Dr. Stark, excited to hear the presentation on sampling design and uh, statistical considerations for a for a network design. Thank you very much. I'm having uh, trouble actually sharing this other window. So if you can run my slides, if that's still possible, that sure. would be great. Otherwise, I'll try to figure this out for some reason. Christina, are you able to, or uh, should I pull that up? Why this isn't? Uh... Trying to pull it up right now. Okay, so we'll we'll have you covered in, in just a minute. Sorry about that. <clears throat> well, I'll I'll, uh, I'll start vaporing while that's uh, while that's happening. I'm. Uh, new to this problem, uh, so I'm still getting up to speed. Forgive me if I say anything stupid. Uh, no reflection on my uh, on my collaborators, just my own my own ignorance. Um, as Andreas mentioned, uh, calling this a census is uh, uh, next slide, please. Um, perhaps a misnomer. Um, a census is really, you know, a complete count. I view a census as an attempt to enumerate, you know, every person living in the United States. This is um, really more of a distributed volume estimate by time and geography. We're not going to be able to measure everybody everywhere. There will always uh, need to be some permanent uh, stations in some places where we get approximately a census given the uncertainty in the detectors that Krista was talking about uh, just a few minutes ago. Um, so we're, the, the goal here is somehow to take those permanent stations and auxiliary information, including uh, location-based services uh, data from cell phones, uh, looking at land use, at urbanization, at weather and other things, and hope that we can combine the, the permanent counters, uh, the location-based service data and shorter term counters used to kind of calibrate and evaluate the, uh, the accuracy of the modeling um, to produce estimates across uh, California infrastructure that have usefully accurate, that are usefully accurate for management needs. Um, so it is basically impossible to do a genuine census, but the hope is to make accurate estimates by combining censuses at individual points with other stuff. Next slide, please. Um, I should point out that there are two different kinds of questions and they have two different kinds of, uh, they, they speak to different accuracy needs and different strategies. The so one is to get an inventory, basically, to understand traffic as a function of time and space um, across uh, California highways or more California infrastructure than that. Um, a second is to evaluate the success or the effect impact of some intervention like building new infrastructure, changing a signal, doing this or that. Generally, the inventory is, uh, I mean, it, it's a bigger problem spatially. You need to monitor more of, of, of the state, but the level of accuracy that you require is likely to be lower than what you need to detect changes, especially because um, the process that's being measured is so highly variable that just looking at something for a few hours or even of a couple of a couple of weeks is unlikely to give you the level of accuracy you need in order to to understand whether whether what you've done um, had the the desired effect. Next slide, please. Um, okay, so how accurate is accurate enough? This really is driven by management needs. There might be some purposes for which knowing things within a factor of five is good enough, and others for which you might need five percent. Next slide, please. All right, so um, to get accurate estimates where you don't have counters and sometimes even where you do have counters is hard. Um, the basic problems as Andreas mentioned and Krista mentioned are you know, low volume, high variability, noisy sensors and counters, a leaky network and small budgets. By leaky network, I mean the kinds of things that Krista was showing where you don't get pedestrians and bicycles sticking to where they're necessarily supposed to be. Um, people jaywalk, they, you know, they go this way and that. You don't have the equivalent of a pipe where you know if some number of riders went in at one end, that number of riders must come out at the other end. Um, 
The counter errors, I mean, there's some, some is understood about that. Krista showed some of that, but it's not really that well quantified. It does depend on the nature of the installation, uh, not just the technology. You know, where is it? What's the traffic like there? We can't really treat the counters as if they're a random sample of riders because the locations where they're deployed isn't random in the first place. Um, short duration counts tend to be noisy just because of natural variability, the process even separate from instrumental effects. Um, the hope is that location-based service data from cell phones will help, but it's also noisy and biased. The penetration, meaning the, the percentage of the ridership that actually have a connected device that is running an app that reports to the particular LBS data vendor um, varies uh, with time, with place, with the kind of rider that the person is. I mean, a, a commuting cyclist might have a very different set of apps than uh, a recreational cyclist out for a you know, weekend warrior type, <clears throat> type jaunt. Um, and, and there's no way to really know how that varies with space and time in order to get um, calibration, get accurate calibration everywhere. Ultimately, we're going to need to model the relationship between these location-based service uh, uh, estimates and physical counts, um, uh, permanent counters, but we only get data at the permanent stations, and those are still you know, relatively few and concentrated in a relatively small number of places. And just by way of example, uh, my understanding is that right now, streetlights volume estimates for all of California are calibrated using permanent stations in San Francisco only. So you might imagine that the quality of that calibration is going to depend a lot um, on where you are, if it's something like an urban environment, like a dense downtown of San Francisco versus um, being out in, in, say, District 1 um, uh, in a much more rural area. Uh, another complication is that um, sort of pure random sampling is going to be of limited use, partly because what we really want is a distributed estimate of what's going on. We don't want an aggregate estimate for California as a whole. Random sampling is good at extrapolating from a sample, if you take the sample randomly, to aggregate properties of population, but it's not good for estimating things for other individuals. Um, it, that said, it may be very useful to use some shorter term counters at random places and times to assess, evaluate, and calibrate some of the models that are trying to link the location-based service data to the ground counters. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so ultimately a lot of what we need to do is gonna be driven by what we would like to know. I mean, is, is you know annual average daily trips enough? Do we need finer time scales? Do we need peak traffic or just average traffic? Uh, does time of day matter? Does day of week matter? Do you want seasonal adjustments? Um, or is it okay to get uh, bikes and pedestrians combined? Do we need them separate? Do we need the directions separately? Do we care about trip purpose? Are we trying to measure intersection crossing times or delays at intersections? Are we trying to measure response from intervention, as I mentioned before? Um, where do we want to know these things? Do we just want to know them for, say, the state highway system where, where uh, bikeways cross state highways? Do we, need to, do we want to know them everywhere in OpenStreetMap? Um, all of these things are going to drive design heavily. Uh, and then how well can we measure, estimate the things that we want to know and in what sense? And that is also going to drive a lot of the statistical development. Um, estimating counts accurately is different from estimating shares accurately. Um, and really, again, we need to understand management needs better. And ultimately, there's a, there's a fundamental problem, which is what is ground truth? And, you know, if we're, we know that the counter technologies, even the ground counter technologies, have some uncertainties associated with them, um, as do uh, humans sitting there, you know, trying to make uh, picket fence tally marks on, on things. Uh, next slide, please. So if we're trying to uh, augment uh, the permanent stations and the location-based service data with statistical estimates based on samples, um, we need to take into account the fact that there's two sorts of uncertainties associated with statistical estimates. There's sampling error that comes from the luck of the draw. So which units happen to be in the sample? Where, when do you happen to take your sample? And then there's systematic error or bias coming from other things. Um, and most notably, um, I think what's going to be driving a lot of the bias in our estimates will be modeling assumptions that are going to be very difficult to 
base in anything like physics, um, be, again, because of the leaky pipe story here. We can't use things like conservation of riders to, uh, to build models that, that are sort of grounded in physical behavior. They're going to be based on empirical associations, and one doesn't know how long how strong those empirical associations are in places other than when you, where you actually have data. Um, and even there, you don't know how long they're going to last um, because all of this stuff is, is a moving target. Things are changing spatially and temporally, um, and especially uh, with the, with the location-based service data. Um, next slide, please. All right, so uh, estimating from a random sample is a bit like throwing darts. Uh, every estimate you know, is going to hit the target in a different place that corresponds to the sampling variability, the scatter in, in the shots. Um, bias is a tendency for everything to land you know, off in generally the same direction, you know, up and to the right. Um, if you're playing darts, you can adjust your aim to reduce your bias because you see where the shots land in relationship to the bullseye. But in problems like this, in general, it's going to be difficult to assess the bias, much less correct for it, because the bullseye isn't really visible. If we knew where the bullseye was, we wouldn't be doing this exercise in the first place. Uh, moreover, you typically only get one throw. You're making one estimate. You're not making a zillion estimates over time and then looking at the average and whether the average differs from, from the truth. Next slide, please. So what are the roles for statistics in uh, this um, estimate of, uh, of active transportation traffic? Well, experimental design and sampling design, um, measuring the uncertainty, assessing the uncertainty, both in the ground-based permanent uh, counters and in the location-based services data, trying to model regularities between those two things in order to leverage the location-based services data to get estimates where you don't have permanent counters, um, calibration, calibration of instruments, calibration of the location-based service volume estimates, uh, and so on. Extrapolation from places where you do have data to places where you don't, and then evaluating how well you're doing and whether the accuracy that you're actually achieving is meeting the management needs. Next slide, please. So um, random is a term of art. And uh, one of the things I want to point out is that people tend to misuse it. Uh, one analogy to keep in mind is uh, stirring soup or tasting soup. If you want to know how salty a pot of soup is, a very good strategy is to stir the pot of soup up and then taste a tablespoon of it. So stirring and taking a tablespoon is like getting a random sample of what's in the pot. Um, next slide. In contrast, if you just stick in a tablespoon without looking, but you don't, um, but you don't stir, that's a haphazard sample. And that's what a lot of sampling in the active transportation space, especially for uh, short-term counts amounts to. You're just kind of sticking a spoon into the traffic um, in, a, in a haphazard way. What you get from doing that um, may not be representative of traffic, partly because of the natural variability, just as if you don't stir the soup, depending on where you put the spoon, you might, uh, you, you, you might get a, a pile of undissolved salt from the bottom of the pot, or you might get uh, something from the top that, that, that isn't salty at all. So it really is important to think about um, how, to, to, how to, to collect samples in a way that is likely to get you something representative or to be able to quantify uh, the distance from representativeness. Next slide, please. So uh, sampling at random doesn't guarantee that your sample will be representative. What it does is give you a way to rigorously quantify how far from representative the sample is likely to be so you can quantify the uncertainties in a way that's useful. Other ways of drawing samples don't let you quantify uncertainty in a way that is reliable and useful. If you do have a random sample, you can often make a statistically unbiased estimator of parameters that you care about. Um, and you can quantify the uncertainty in those estimates from other kinds of samples, not so much. Next slide, please. So these are just terms of art, but they're things that are worth thinking about when you're designing a network, design, thinking about where to put sensors and, and, and what it is you're trying to do. 
So the unit in sampling design is the, the individual that you sort of care about. And we need to think about, and Krista mentioned this, do we care about the trip, the rider, the infrastructure, the location, the traffic signal? What is it that, that really matters to us? Um, the population is the collection of those units that we care about. The sampling frame is the set of units from which you are going to draw the sample. And that is often not identical to the population. When they, don't, when they aren't the same, uh, you need to worry about frame bias. Um, that is, you, the difference between the sampling frame and the population can itself be a source of bias. If you, are, uh, if you have no possibility of getting some of the units that really are in your population, or if you have some probability of getting units that aren't part of the population, those, both of those things can skew the results. Um, in general, it's better to be over-inclusive than under-inclusive in the frame, especially if you have a way on the back end of saying, oh, this isn't one of the ones I cared about. I'm going to toss it and, and, uh, and, and don't focus on those that, uh, that are part of the relevant population. So the sampling units are what you actually draw. Um, when, you know, if we think about something like counting uh, pedestrians or, or, or bicycles going pat through a particular intersection, if we're sampling the intersection, then sampling that intersection doesn't correspond to sampling a single pedestrian it, it, or, or bicycle. It corresponds to a cluster sample of that. Um, by looking there, then you get a collection of units from the population that you might care about. Um, all right, next slide, please. I'm supposed to finish in the next minute or so. Um, so uh, these are just a quick taxonomy of uh, kinds of samples. Grab samples like short-term counts are an example of samples of convenience. Next slide. You got you got four minutes. We we're, we're running four minutes. Okay. Late. Yeah. Great. Thanks a lot. Um, and for random samples, there's a lot of knobs you can fiddle to make the logistics work better or improve the accuracy of your estimates or both of those things. So are you going to sample an individual or a cluster? Are you going to do your sampling with or without replacement, with or without weights? A reason you might want to use weights is to have a larger probability of sampling places where you expect there to be more traffic. That would help you get more accurate estimates of totals on the whole than wasting some of your sample by getting some locations that aren't, aren't going to contain many bicycles if you, if you sort of already know that going in. Um, are you going to stratify? So you might want to uh, ensure that your sample has uh, some number of stations at uh, th that are very urban, that are where, where population is dense, some other places where maybe you know you have good infrastructure, some other places that are more rural or where the infrastructure uh, is, is less robust. Um, uh, next slide, please. All right, um, let's go on. Next slide. Uh, uh, so, I mean, the, the design question really is when and where should we be sampling? Um, and part of this, my, my thinking about this is that we need some, uh, per, we're always going to need some permanent stations and more is better, although details matter as Krista uh, uh, discussed, um, but this really does need to be driven by management goals. Um, that's going to inform where, when, how we design the network, how we calibrate it, and how we evaluate whether we're doing okay or not. Next slide, please. All right, so uh, as mentioned before, there's very few stations. The geographic coverage isn't great. There are a lot of dropouts. The instruments don't really collect good data 24 seven, at least many of them don't. There are counting errors that vary with technology and with where they are, uh, where they're deployed and the nature of the traffic that they're counting. There are issues identifying the transportation mode uh, that depends on the counter technology and on the environment. Um, it, we need, if we're gonna do this at scale, like all of California, we really need access to APIs, the uh, programming interfaces for the, the counting technology in order to be able to automate this stuff. There are problems in that there's a lack of consistent metadata in uh, some of these counters. So if you're setting up your network, a very important thing will be to standardize your metadata so that you can actually get useful data from everything in an automated way and not have to do a lot of handwork every time you want to incorporate data from a new station into, uh, into your dashboard or into your planning or anything else. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, um, so we, we really want to know how much uh, cell phone location-based uh, data, location-based service data can help. Um, all vendors have secret sauce uh, in their data products and their accuracy really is largely unknown. 
Um, without casting aspersions on anyone, I would treat any claim of accuracy as advertising, not as science, absent some peer reviewed you know, study that, that assesses the accuracy and not just at a single place, but at places that are different from where the calibration data was used to generate the estimates in the first place. Um, so they may do very well, you know, for example, Streetlight might do very well in San Francisco where they have the ground based stations that they used to calibrate um, their volume estimates, but might not do so well in, say, you know, Arcata or, you know, someplace in, in, in rural California um, instead. Um, ultimately, we're going to have to build a model that relates the actual traffic to the data providers estimates in order to calibrate or recalibrate what they're doing. The kinds of variables we expect are going to matter are things like land use, urbanization, climate, weather, time of day, etc. Um, but unless we're going to deploy more ground based counters, um, some combination of permanent and shorter duration, but shorter duration doesn't mean a couple of hours, I think it probably means a minimum of a week, um, if I'm understanding Krista's concerns, um, uh, in order to, to, to validate and check the accuracy of what we're doing. Um, next slide, please. Um, one of the big complications with cell phone data is that uh, the penetration, that is the number of users, the number of riders who are carrying a phone that uses one of the apps that feeds the location-based data in is going to vary with, with location, time of day, geography, all kinds of stuff, even the purpose of the trip. Um, and changes in penetration will appear to be changes in traffic. Um, so un disentangling those things is going to be hard. Um, discriminating transportation modes is always subject to some uncertainty and everything is changing all the time. Um, the system is changing all the time. Next slide, please. Um, next slide. All right, so uh, this is kind of where we are. We're still um, working uh, while we're getting our feet wet, we're identifying management needs. We really do want to leverage these permanent counters, uh, location-based service data and temporary counters. Um, automate and parameterize data cleaning and flagging. Um, the, uh, the, the task of cleaning and merging the data and the lack of metadata are substantial challenges. And I think we need more work to assess the counter and location-based uh, service uh, uh, um, volume estimates, uh, their errors and uncertainties. Um, there's a lot of work to do uh, post stratification, kind of identifying where there are regularities that can be exploited and then establishing how stable they are and continuing to monitor what's going on because they're not going to be stable forever. Everything is going to change. So this is going to be an ongoing process, including the statistical design. And ultimately, we need to know, you know, are we able to attain a level of accuracy that's adequate for management needs? If not, um, what do we need to do to augment the network? And is that going to be affordable? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. I, I think as we're going through our first couple of presentations here, we're starting to learn about all the places we can we can have missteps and go wrong as we're as we're setting up uh, one of these count programs. So, um, so we're now going to turn to um, Dr. Julia Griswold, also from UC Berkeley. Um, Julia, if you want to share your screen, so Dr. Griswold is a senior researcher at the um, Safe Transportation Research and Education Center at UC Berkeley, um, and her research expertise and interests include collection and processing of non-motorized transportation data. Uh, bicycle, bicycle and pedestrian and exposure modeling, um, improving access to safety data and bicyclist, bicyclist level of service measures. Um, Dr. Griswold is also a member of the team working on that Caltrans District 1 pilot. Um, so um, Julia, we're excited to learn about what we can do to ensure quality count data. Um, and I will turn it over to you. Thank you for being here. Thanks, Mike. Um, I'm assuming you can see my slides just fine right now. Okay, great. Yes. Um, yeah, so so once we've designed our um, uh, census network and we know where we want to um, install our counters, um, then we want to make sure that our um, that the data we collect with our automated counters is um, good quality. Um, so uh, there's a few questions that I'm going to go over in my slides. I don't say I have the absolute answers, but um, some ideas about um, how we address these issues. I'm going to talk a bit about why we focus on continuous counts um, and the problems that we see with short-term count data, um, what we should expect um, good um, automated count data to look like um, from different types of sites. Um, the types of validation and quality um, checking that we want to do on our automated counter data, 
and um, a bit about um, why metadata is important. And then I'll give a, a very brief overview of the upcoming statewide active transportation database project. Um, so I have a couple examples about um, some of the problems that you'll see with short duration counts and why um, they're uh, not representative enough of uh, the activity at a given site um, to be used uh, to be uh, completely useful. So um, here we're looking at um, AM, PM peak counts at two different sites. We've got our orange and our blue site. And um, it looks like the total activity at these two locations is uh, pretty similar. But then uh, when we look at the, um, the, the hourly counts over the entire day, we see that these sites have very different patterns. Um, and uh, if you use, if you made the assumption that these had the same amounts of activity, you would be off by a factor of greater than two. So um, uh, this is, you know, a, a problem that you see with these um, AM, PM uh, counts. So you have, um, you have to make assumptions about what kind of activity you're seeing um, at a given location. So the orange one is more of a downtown. I believe the blue site is uh, close to a school. So you're seeing peaks that are around um, pick up and drop off times. So, um, and then there are other fluctuations that you're gonna see week to week at the same site. So here we have four weeks, uh, four consecutive weeks of um, AM, PM, uh, two hour peak counts um, at the same location. And um, you can see the, the PM counts are fairly similar, but the, the morning counts are, um, are not as close. So our mean for this location is um, just under 1300 and um, the values, if you just um, tried to take one of these um, weeks as representative, this you know Wednesday uh, AM PM, you would be ranging from undercount of 5% to overcount of 14% for your sort of average activity. So, and even uh, 24 hour counts at a given site only reduce the, the error somewhat. So um, here we have the hourly counts for the entire um, Wednesday. That's um, a mean daily count of 5,700. And we have a range of um, undercounting by 8% and overcounting by 10%. Um, and you know this is just uh, one month of data. There might be more variations um, uh, in uh, the peak of summer or uh, in the dead of winter when you have um, uh, weather variations uh, causing more issues. Um, and you know those were just looking at uh, very short-term counts, but um, as as Krista mentioned, the uh, you really want to have at least a week of data to um, to get better estimates of what your activity is. And um, there, there's been research that has looked into this. And you know, depending on your scaling method, um, you're you're going to have a lot of error um, if you're just looking at a few days of counts. Or um, and it's you know even higher when you have these very short term counts. So, so now that we, we know we want to do our uh, automated counting, um, what, do you, what should you expect your data to look like? Um, so this is uh, a location where we collected um, a few years of data. It's in uh, downtown Oakland, and we had an infrared counter set, set up um, collecting um, pedestrian activity on a sidewalk. Um, and you can see that um, the, this is sort of an average of the activity over that period. And we have um, a peak at midday, so noon, when most people are going out and buying lunch. Um, this is not a big nighttime activity downtown, um, especially this part of downtown. Um, 
so the um, activity goes pretty down pretty steeply in the evening, and then we have less activity on the weekends because there aren't a ton of people coming here um, for entertainment or other things. So then this is a different site, um, different kind of site. We have an urban trail um, in Clovis. And so this is in the Central Valley. Um, there's much less activity at this site. So um, our curves aren't as smooth just because there's, um, you know, with lower volumes, just one or two extra pedestrians or bicyclists can um, cause, you know, larger fluctuations. Um, but you can still see the general pattern here. So you have a little more activity in the mornings and um, the weekday volumes tend to be lower than the weekend volumes. So um, this these may not be beautiful curves, but this is what you might expect on um, a lower volume, uh, more rural site. Um, and then, uh, so, Annual and seasonal trends are going to be weaker in California, and um, you know, in other parts of the U.S., you're going to see um, you know big dips around the winter because of um, you know inclement weather, um, and that, that's not such an issue in California. Um, but we can see some uh, general trends based on other types of activity. So um, our blue line here is um, an elementary school, and we can see the, the um, uh, pedestrian volumes are lower in May, June, and July, um, increasing in August. So this is um, when you expect kids to be out of school. The university campus um, is also uh, dips the lowest in July, um, as well as December. And then we have a downtown that is a little more stable. Uh, throughout the year. So um, to start with, once you've installed your counter, um, as the other presenters have mentioned, you need to do validation at the site. So um, for permanent counters, this means counting um, at least 100 people. So you can do that with manual counts, or you can collect video and record uh, the counts in your office. Um, and this allows you to compute accuracy adjustment factors. And so you're just taking your actual count divided by the automated count. Um, and um, you know, this also lets you identify if there are any issues with the way you've set up the counter um, you know, with passive infrared. Um, as Krista mentioned, there could be um, cars or other things that are um, causing issues with um, how it's recording. Um, pedestrians, or it could be with tubes or uh, inductive loops that it might be recording cars. So, um, you know, uh, you, you can't do a ton maybe to adjust uh, once you've installed your inductive loops, but you may with uh, passive infrared or tubes want to um, adjust how you set up and um, aim your devices. Um, for short-term counters, um, you want to count at least 10 people, just make sure it's doing it correctly, and you can also um, calculate accuracy adjustment factors, um, which will be useful for those. And then really important is to document the results of the validation, um, particularly if the, these data are going to be used by others. Um, and then you can adjust your data to account for the known bias. So. Um, once you've started collecting your data, um, you're going to notice some weird things, um, and uh, particularly with these automated counts where you have 15 minute intervals, it can be overwhelming to try to identify um, where the problems are. So um, there's a number of researchers and practitioners who have developed quality control checks, um, and I'm not going to go through all of these, but there's um, some important general categories. So you have um, identifying upper bound and lower bound. So this is just seeing what kind of outliers there are if you have crazy increases um, and decreases that, uh, that don't seem typical for the site. Um, uh, identical non-zero values. Um, so that is more typically if someone has um, manipulated the data um, and you wanna be able to flag those. Um, 
and that's a sort of less likely case. Um, and then consecutive zeros is often just um, malfunctioning of the device or um, loss of uh, battery life. And um, you want to try to uh, remove full days at a time when you do those consecutive zeros. Um, and then directional split can just um, give you a sense of uh, if if your if your results are really making sense. So I have some examples here of uh, just a few possible quality control checks. So um, this is some real data um, from uh, it's a daily pedestrian counts on a multi-use path. And we see that um, the volumes are fairly level for a period. And then um, around the 19th of January, we have a big increase. And then after that, the volumes are a little lower. So say we had um, a maximum and minimum threshold that I've made up here. Um, you know, This daily max of 2000 would flag the um, very high volumes. And then um, the daily minimum of 150 would flag those lower ones. And so um, this is just telling you, you need to look in this area, assuming we haven't graphed it. Um, but when you do look at this data, all of these data are questionable. So um, I would recommend removing this entire period. Um, you know, even, even if a specific data point wasn't flagged, if it's in between these other ones and it doesn't look like the rest, um, it, it should be removed. Here's a similar example, um, possibly even from the same site. Um, but we have, uh, you know, relatively stable counts and we have a few days where there seem to be um, outlier volumes. Um, but then if you look a little closer, you examine them. Here we have our um, 1,200 daily max um, threshold uh, that flags these three sites. If you look a little closer, these are all, all on weekends. So it's actually believable that there could be an event that brought uh, potentially 2,000, uh, uh, you know, 2,800 people to that location. So um, in this case, you know, depending on your use for the data, you, you might actually want to keep these. Um, consecutive zeros, this is one of the easy ones to identify. You can just remove the full days around this um, and, and move on. Um, so inverted AM, PM. So this is a case you're more likely to see um, not with the data that is automatically um, transmitted from the counters, but if you have to manually download data and then upload it to your computer. Sometimes the um, AM PM gets inverted. And the easy check for that is just to take the ratio of um, 3 AM divided by 3 PM. And if that's greater than one, you want to flag that and check it out. And you can see this pattern here um, doesn't make sense because um, you have the highest volumes at um, one in the morning. And so once you correct that, you can see that this is a, a pattern that makes more sense. So, um, so metadata, we, we've, uh, a few of my fellow presenters have mentioned this quite a bit and I wanted to um, go over an example, but particularly the things that, um, that are really helpful for other users when they're um, trying to uh, uh, take advantage of uh, your very valuable data that you've collected is you want to have um, detailed location information. You want to, um, we want to know what the count technology is, what the modes are that are detected, um, what the directions of travel are, and what facility type it falls on. And um, this is all information that um, is uh, included in the TMG non motorized station location information, but you know. Even for non-TMG data, we want we want to see uh, this information so that we can use your data. So I have a sample from Oakland. Um, there's uh, so this is a screenshot of the map from the count vendor's website. So it shows a little flag on Harrison Street, um, 
And um, so that's where this counter is located. Um, and so looking at the satellite imagery, we see that there is a buffered bike lane um, in one direction. Um, on the right side of the street, there is um, a cycle track. Um, and then um, I think Google also indicates that there's a multi-use path along here as well. Um, but you know this uh, this map kind of indicated that maybe it's actually in the motor vehicle travel lane. Um, so the really helpful thing here is that um, the vendor site or the city of Oakland also uploaded a photo showing exactly where their inductive loops were installed here. So we can see them um, marked on the pavement right in the cycle track. So that is super helpful. And um, the reason we're trying to you know, identify this exact location is because we're trying to match it um, as part of this active transportation census project for um, Caltrans. We're trying to match that with um, uh, the, the big data sources. So um, we were trying to identify you know, which of these lines in the Strava Metro database, which of these links um, is that should we compare that to? And so uh, we could see there that it's this this cycle track, and um, the activity is pretty high there. So um, so we're we're able to match those. Um, and then the other thing you need to keep in mind um, with the system is that some of those bicycle traces might be misassigned to the long, wrong link. So, so this is where we're going to see most of that bike activity. Some of it may have been misassigned to um, either the sidewalk or the motor vehicle travel lanes. Um, and so then the other thing uh, with data metadata is making sure you have um, your channels identified and the directionality. So here's just an example from a bridge in Portland. We have shared use path, um, eastbound and westbound traffic lanes. And so our detectors are, um, we have tube counters here. So they're measuring the westbound bicyclists. Actually, because there are two tubes, it can um, uh, capture directionality. So if there are eastbound bicyclists, it could capture them as well. Um, and then we have unmeasured flow of the east and westbound pedestrians. So an example of um, an issue here related to this, um, in the past, I was trying to validate counts on a pathway. Um, and the, the vendor system had the, um, the channels identified as um, bicyclists and pedestrians. And so I was out there trying to measure and I couldn't find any match between these data. There was no logic to it. Um, and I eventually figured out that uh, the counter was measuring directionality, not modes. So this was a, a data entry error that made the data much more challenging to work with. So um, if you're a little overwhelmed about all this um, data collection and processing, um, Caltrans Active Transportation Resource Center um, is here to help. So um, they have funded a project called the Statewide Active Transportation Database. And the goal is to improve active transportation data collection by setting statewide methodologies for counting and storing volumes of active transportation users. Um, so the, the project has um, two main tasks. So there's research tasks, and um, basically this is developing guidance for um, uh, collecting counts, um, temporal adjustment factors, accuracy adjustment factors, and um, data validation procedures. Maybe one more minute to wrap up, Julia. Yep, I'm, I'm almost there. <laughs> um, and then... Then there's the data development task. And um, this is expanding um, the geographic scope of SCAG's um, ATDB that you'll hear a little more about from Hina. And um, uh, we'll be rebuilding the system 
and um, creating a data dashboard and um, mapping tool. There's going to be automated data validation and processing steps. So you can do your validation counts and um, enter those data and we'll help you develop the validation or the accuracy adjustment factors and apply those to your data. Um, and then uh, there's a manual data collection app and um, import and export API. Um, and it's also going to be compatible with the TMG uh, format. So, so that's it. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Julia. That was that was uh, very useful and um, I think some some really good illustrations of what can go wrong and 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 how to how to um, plan for that and correct for that. So so this has been a lot of information in this session. Um, we thought we would round out with maybe a little bit more of a hands-on demonstration. Um, so the state of Texas. Um, has uh, has uh, has their own program for collecting bike and pedestrian data, and we're um, very happy to welcome Dr. Phil Lasley from um, Texas A&M's uh, Transportation Institute, um, and he's an associate research scientist there and serves as a point of contact for this Texas Bicycle and Pedestrian Account Exchange. Um, and Phil, so you've done a lot of work on uh, multimodal uh, performance measure development, data quality management, etc. Um, so really happy to have your skill set and, and knowledge and expertise here as well, and excited to, to uh, see this demo. So I'll turn it over to you, and your screen looks good. Yeah, thank you. Um, boy, just listening to all these presentations have has been a triggering experience with a lot of PTSD over the last couple of years of things that we have kind of gone through the trenches in trying to figure out. Um, but I think we have developed something that, um, based on everybody who's spoken today has really kind of gone where you guys are going. So I'm, I'm happy to show what we've developed. Um, we call this the Texas Bicycle and Pedestrian Count Exchange or the BPCX for short. It's really split into two different parts. Um, fundamentally, we have what's called the public portal, um, which is what, you know, what you're seeing right now that the public can access um, for free. Um, just kind of in a ready-made format. Um, and then we have kind of the behind the, the scenes portal and that's where a lot of the magic happens. But I'm gonna show elements of the first, the public side, so you can kind of get an idea of the end result. Um, and note that we're actually rolling out a pretty massive update to what this will look like in the next month or two. Uh, should be ready by the end of the fiscal year. So uh, come back and take a look when, when that happens. But uh, we have this uh, landing page. Um, it has links to a lot of resources on TechStot's page. Um, we have a user manual that shows everything about it. Um, that's a good resource for y'all if you want to kind of breeze through that. But when you when you come to it, you get to this landing page that has a lot of like statewide um, overarching statistics. So right now, as of 4 a.m. last night, we have 150 permanent count locations in Texas and 497 short duration locations. The big thing about this was in Texas, uh, TechStock controls exclusively how vehicles are counted. Um, they do not have that exclusive control with non-motorized counts. So they recognize that they need to start doing these counts, but they can't be the ones to do it all because they don't have the local knowledge. So one of the difficulties was trying to get all the different data types, um, all the different agencies coordinated, um, all the data into one form, um, and to be able to see that. And this is the system kind of does that. So for example, I'm in the Austin area. If you hover over Austin, you can see just a breakdown of the permanent and short duration counts. But then if I click on Travis County, where I'm located, um, you see um, a dashboard of our permanent and short duration. Permanent's in blue, short duration is in orange. Um, so you can kind of see where um, the different counting sites are located. Um, if I were to hover over one, you see the name of the trail or the count location and who or what agency uh, owns that data. And that's really crucial because for the first time, agencies can see uh, where other count locations are and they can spend their money a little more wisely and not duplicate effort. 
For example, here in Austin, the city of Austin transportation department has their own count program and urban trails, which is more or less the parks department had their own counting program. And they were putting counters almost right on top of each other, this location being one of them. And so just showing them where there was overlap allowed them to move counters to different locations to uh, get a better bang for their buck. If you click on this site, it takes you to um, kind of the counter page, and this is getting a complete overhaul. Uh, but you have different elements like the day of week averages, time of day averages by mode and direction. And then you have a list of total counts. Um, and this is at the daily subtotal level, but you can expand this anywhere from a yearly uh, total all the way down to the raw 15 minute data. The other thing is by default, this shows just the valid and what we call abnormal but valid data. Uh, when we started going through the quality review process, we found there were some times that you'd have unusually high counts that were valid. Um, and this is what makes quality controlling of non-motorized data very difficult. I, because I'm an Austin resident and I know this location, I can tell you right off the bat, um, these are the Austin City Limit music festivals. Um, and then this is, I don't know if you can see this right here, this dip, that's uh, Winter Storm Uri when our, shape, our state shut down. Um, so there's lots of different things in there that we created our own flag called abnormal but valid. Um, and that allows us to kind of separate some of those things out if we need to. Um, the other thing too, we have um, this total number and percent growth over the previous year. We're actually doing away with this most likely um, just because we're finding it's very, very hard to gauge, you know, is 600,000 a normal number? Is it a high number? Is it a low number? Um, it's really, really difficult for people's minds to, uh, to judge you know, and compare different sites from, with, uh, from one another. So we likely will be taking this away and instead replacing it uh, with AADT and AADT-like numbers. Um, we have created a process now that automatically calculates using Federal Highways guidance um, all the different DTs um, that are available, and those will be um, replacing some of that information. On this portal, you can actually filter by travel direction, count type, whether it's all non-motorized traffic, bicycles or pedestrians. You can even specify specific days of the week and it'll filter those out for you. Um, down here in the corner, there's a little arrow. And if you hover over it, it points to a plus or minus sign. That's how you zoom in or zoom out in your data. Um, uh, qual or not quality, um, how you get to the 15 minute level or the yearly level. And then up here you have uh, a button that if I click it will take you to a Google Maps location of that site and you can see exactly where that site is. So the, the interesting thing that powers this is actually our behind the scenes portal and it's password protected. Um, that way each agency can have different users and uh, different user access. Um, I'm what's called a super admin, so I can actually float between all the different agencies that we have um, within our system to be able to uh, manipulate and do things that need to be done. But this is TechStot's uh, user system, and right now they have 30 permanent counters, uh, one human observation count um, that we've input. They have several, but we just put that one in, and then 232 short duration locations. One of the things uh, about site location is exactly that. It is difficult to choose sites for permanent locations. And one of the things that TechStot has decided to prioritize um, is locations that give a geographical diversity, but also diversity with different factors. Like, is it on, you know, most of the time counters are exclusively on trails. We're trying to branch that out so there's lots of sidewalks, lots of uh, separated paths, uh, bike lanes, different things so that we can uh, create adjustment factors and seasonalization for the short duration counts. Um, over here on the left, we have all the different processes. Um, and over here under import, the first step to uh, creating some of these things is to actually add the station location and its metadata. 
Now we've set up uh, an agreement with EcoVisio and EcoCounter to where we plug directly into their system and we can pull any information uh, with permission uh, from any agency in Texas. So you can either add a station manually or uh, we can import a station from EcoVisio and I'll show you kind of what this looks like. So right now it's going out to EcoVisio and it's pulling all that station metadata that they have and we've entered most of them, but there's a couple that we haven't yet, but I'll show you one just as an example. If I were to click add station, this, is, this one is in Houston. And we have a form that they fill out that has the different metadata elements in it. So we have an internal name and we have the public name. Uh, of course, your geographic information, latitude and longitude, the serial number of the counter, the date that the station was established, and then the date it was discontinued, and then a date to start importing counts. Um, and previously we talked about um, channel and flows. Uh, we call them flows. Uh, Eco and some of the other companies call them channel IDs. But this is where um, we pull in that information on directionality and type. So we can say, you know, what are the different what are we counting specifically? And this comes directly from uh, the TMG guide. Uh, we can look at directions, so all directions. We also have the ability to look at wrong way directions, and I'll show an example of that. Um, and then the type of sensor. Um, so we have directions for all the different types of uh, sensors that are out there uh, currently. Um, other information, you know, you can say what the vendor is, the counting method, uh, if it's a permanent or portable or human, uh, count purpose, the interval, you have a notes field, um, you have some functional classification of the roadway if it's associated with one and the facility type. Um, this, this is something that the TMG guide requires that we absolutely hate. Um, it's very, very specific and confusing information on where the counter is located. Um, so the direction of route refers to the cardinal direction of the roadway that it's associated with um, or the, the trail. And then you have the direction of movement. And this is what really gets people confused uh, because all of these are relative based on some of your first couple answers. Like this one, location of count relative to the direction of route. We're actually gonna do an update of this next year where we make this a picture. So you just click on where your counter is and kind of you have a diagram of a, a roadway section or an intersection. And once you click that and you enter in a couple other bits of information, it will just automatically do all this for you. And then we have other metadata items uh, like information about the roadway, if it's associated with one, information about the non-motorized facility, and then additional features. And some of these we have talked about adding more, adding less. Um, there's a lot of data here to fill out. It can be cumbersome, so you have to balance that need, but also you want as much metadata as possible so that you can do different things in the planning and research side of it. And then finally, we have contact details, which is uh, has provider and requester. And this we found important because uh, in this case, I'm in TxDOT's user uh, environment, TechStop owns the data. The provider is who collects the data, the data uh, for TechStop. And the requester is if somebody requests TechStop to collect specific data. So that record going back and forth is important to them. And that's one of the things that we added. Once you have all the information in, you click add station and a dot appears on the map. But a dot's not enough. You have to import counts. And so we can either upload manual counts, and this is usually short duration. Um, we have programmed this to accept the file format of almost every major vendor. Um, we have our own custom format, um, and then we can do Eco, Trafex, Timark, and Jmar. We're working on some of the video um, styles now, um, and we'll get that in the next few months, uh, so it'll auto input, input that. And then we also have an automatic download from EcoVisio, and I'll kind of show you an example of how that works. So right now it's going to the API and pulling all the information for the different counters that we have in there. And I'm going to look for a specific one in Dallas. 
All I have to do is check that box. This is the date of data, the last data imported. So we last imported at the end of April. And then I'll go down at the bottom and I can set an end date for that import. So I'm gonna set it for yesterday because that was the last full day. And I'll just hit import. And now I can do one counter, I can do all the counters simultaneously. The server, we use Azure uh, Cloud Services, will do that automatically. So you'll see this green bar, it's being processed right now. Uh, it's going out to EcoVisio and it's inputting that. But while it's in pulling that data in, it's running a first set of quality control checks. So it's looking for null values. So if there was a period, I just got an email that it was done, I think. Um, if there were null values, so a date, a date stamp doesn't exist, but it should, um, it will actually insert that null value date stamp and then put a null value in there. That's important for permanent count locations where um, that indicates, you know, the battery died, there might be a connection issue. Uh, it's important to see that. There's a couple other things that it does, but what I'll do is while that's loading, I will show a quick demo of our quality control feature because we have built in a lot of those uh, quality control checks that were being discussed. Let me scroll down to one. And Phil, maybe like two more minutes. Does sure. that sound good? Okay, thanks. So if I were to click one, this is a short duration location that we already have uh, data pulled in from. Um, you have your daily subtotals up here and you have the raw data down here. And over here on the side, you have a little bit of information. You can click on a map and see where it is. And then you have the different quality control tests that we found. Um, and what the orange shows is that it fails one of the tests. And if you hover over it, it will actually show you what test it fails. Same with data here. Here it passes all of the different tests. Um, what we've found is that every location is so different. These tests, while helpful, are almost initially worthless. Um, just because you have to calibrate it to every location. One thing I'll point out too is you have southbound wrong way line here, and then you have northbound, and then you have northbound wrong way, which notice this is a non-zero thing, but that indicates the tech side is there's a lot of people going the wrong direction um, on this particular bike lane. And so that's a safety issue that they can then immediately address. Um, but down here we you can quality review the data. This has already been quality reviewed, but you can change it to the different types of invalid data and update that. And then once you're done, you can actually click certify here and it will push that data out of this quarantine pen into the public viz at 4 a.m. tonight. We're working on uh, the ability to apply adjustment factors. Uh, so with permanent locations, you know, uh, an occlusion factor or some, side of some sort of correction factor, and with short duration, duration, you'd be able to expand that out and get an AADT uh, based on uh, other factors that we have. But that is essentially the system. We also have export and reporting features, um, and then of course some backend stuff, but that is truly the heart of it. And right now we have, I think, 18 agencies using it. So it is a very robust system. Well, thank you so much for sharing that, Bill. Really yeah. helpful to see some some what this can look like in the real world. Um, so we're going to transition to taking some questions now. Um, and I did want to just uh, draw everyone's attention. So um, in the Q&A box, I, I think everyone should be able to see all the questions being submitted. Our speakers have been typing answers to many of those as we've been going. So I encourage folks to, to look at those responses if you're interested. Um, and I'll probably maybe dredge up one or two of those um, for discussion among the wider group. But um, Andreas, maybe we can start with a question for you. Um, we had someone ask um, whether Caltrans is gonna be working with regional and local partners um, to help implement active transportation programs that close network gaps. Thanks for the question. That's a, that's a really good question. Um, so there's a couple of things that are happening. So the, the work that Berkeley is doing uh, to develop the collection uh, protocols and the database, um, those are tools that will be applicable to any agency or organization in California uh, collecting this data. In terms of actually establishing a count station that is off of outside of the Caltrans right of way, um, 
that it's it's early days still to understand how we're going to be working with our partners to do that. So we know that um, at least from the Caltrans side, our management needs um, will include that we do have information needs off of the state highway. So we will be looking to collect some of that information, but exactly how we go about that, where and how many stations we need, how do we partner with uh, our local partners, um, with the CTC, with FHWA to, to try to fund those kinds of stations. We just don't have the answers to that yet. Um, but those are, those are important questions that we'll be asking over the next couple of years as we set about developing the design for the statewide network. Thank you. Um, Krista, maybe I could ask this next question to you and certainly invite others to chime in as well. Um, but there is a question about um, just how to kind of factor in all these different variables when, when um, collecting data. And the question was specifically about weather and how much we need to kind of, you know, add correction factors for, you know, rainy days versus sunny days. And, um, you know, just kind of how, how deep do we need to get, get in to kind of capture all these factors that influence uh, pedestrian and bicycle travel? Yeah, so this is one of the reasons that we want to collect for a week, at least a week at all our locations, because weather happens um, and weather is part of normal life. Um, so if we're collecting for at least a week, you know, it, maybe it's raining one day, but you know, the rest of the days are different, uh, similar for that time of year. Um, if we do have some extreme weather event, a hurricane comes in, maybe we do want to collect for an additional week or two. But um, generally, if you can collect for the longer period of a week or two, then then you don't have to worry so much about that weather event uh, that may happen on one of those days. If you want to avoid things like holidays, so don't collect during the July 4th holiday or Memorial Day. Um, in other areas, not necessarily California, uh, but you want to look at avoiding winter. Um, you all have very different weather there, so you want to collect more in your higher volume, um, more uh, consistent travel pattern time periods. Um, so, you know, September is often a very good time. You, school has started and um, things are starting to, to uh uh, open up. So um, yeah, th that usually accounts for it, but you want to make sure that you have a permanent counter somewhere um, in your region where you can, that that will uh, account for some of that weather variation. If you have multiple um, permanent counters that are in that region, in that climatic and geographic region, and in that similar travel pattern, then you can create those um, adjustment factors for um, that will automatically account for the weather because they're in the same region affected by that same weather. Great. And with any of these questions, you know, if, if other folks want to chime in, just turn on your camera, and we'll know that you're you're looking to to add your two cents. So thank you, Krista. Um, the, the next question, um, Sarisha, I don't know if you're on and available, but this may actually be a good question for you, and I don't think it's something you're going to talk about in your presentation. Um, so anyway, Sarisha, if you're there, um, maybe let me know. Otherwise, I'll just, I'll ask it to you in your next. Uh, yeah, I'm here. I'm here. Okay, great. So um, we got uh, several questions about, um, about, um, uh, uh, traffic detection data or about um, uh, pedestrian uh, push button data and um, and I think I think folks are interested in just you know what value this data has how it can be used to um, maybe be part of a, of a of a bigger data collection effort and um, the the questioner specifically said that Krista mentioned that some other DOTs are starting to use traffic controller count data in different ways so um, you've done some research on this. Can, can you share any, any kind of insights in general about how that data might, might or might not play a part in, in count programs? Sure. Um, I think the, the biggest potential with that data is, um, is that you know, push buttons are present everywhere, right? And so they're existing infrastructure. We don't have to install something new. And with the new traffic signal controllers, uh, we are able to get this high resolution data um, back into the controller, which we can then access and mine the data. The important thing to remember though, is that um, the, they are actuations, right? So they provide a measure 
of the activity and they're a proxy for demand, but they're not giving us the actual count. And so we have to then um, install some videos, collect some data and develop some scaling factors to sort of get those ratios between how many pedestrians are actually in the crosswalk versus what the uh, push button actuations are telling us. And so once we develop those scaling factors by different land use contexts and other measures of the built environment, then uh, we can you know, have these measures of pedestrian volumes um, across the entire network. So uh, thanks for the shout out, Krista. Um, so my colleague, Patrick Singleton, has already done this uh, for Utah DOT. And so they have these pedestrian volumes at um, multiple uh, intersections all throughout Utah. And currently we have a project in uh, Oregon uh, working with the Oregon DOT to do the same thing. Um, so one question um, I was looking through the chat and it does often get asked is, uh, what happens if somebody pushes the button multiple times, right? So how do you account for that? And uh, we do uh, see that in the data. And so we have scripts and things to say, okay, if there are multiple presses occurring within a few seconds of each other, then we, you know, um, just filter them out and then just assume that it's, it's, it's one um, person doing that. Great, thank you. Um... Maybe last question for now, and, and Liz, maybe I'll direct this one at you since um, it was a question in the chat that you typed your response to. I don't think the, the full group was able to see. Um, we, I think it's more of a question about interpreting data that is collected, but the question was about, you know, whether from this or how from this data can you kind of discern um, recreational trips versus commute trips and, and, and kind of different types of travel if you're just kind of collecting this raw data. So it's, uh, it's amazing the first time I ever saw any bike ped data that was 24 hours in duration or more, that how similar to motorized traffic data it is and how the patterns are very similar. Um, they might be less in volume, but the pattern is the same. And what happens is you have that sort of people going to work in the morning peak and then you have a lunch peak and then you have uh, maybe even a higher peak in the evening, which would indicate uh, people commuting and coming, maybe some recreational travelers at the five o'clock PM time. And then you can look at um, the weekend data where you have really just one, usually one peak and it's somewhere noon to one o'clock in the afternoon. So. So as we start to look at the data, it really starts to tell us the story about the type of travelers and we can start to classify the type of facility and how the facility is used. And then from there, we can actually get federal transportation funding and that data can drive um, some facilities are eligible for transportation funding if they're shown to be commute um, facilities. So there's all sorts of stuff we can do with that, but that's how we know uh, types of travelers. Um, we can also spot check and be on site and look at the people that are wearing Lycra <laughs> versus the people that are in a tie. Um, and, and, and that's the only other way uh, without stopping and doing an intercept survey to ask them where they're going and what the purpose of their trip is. So, yeah. Great, thank you. Okay, well, um, I think we are due for another break. Um, we're going to take another 10 minute break. So that means that we will be back here at 11.06 a.m. After the break, we're going to hear from a couple practitioners who are uh, we're actually implementing count programs um, for, for regional, regional governments. Um, so I think that'll be great. And I uh, hope to see you then at 11.06. Thank you.